This is the Bears Barroom Radio Network, and we're brought to you by the Verdoliac Law Group, fighting insurance companies since 1963, and BetChicago.com, your source for all of Chicago's sports and betting news. Hey, Bears Girl, what's your favorite jingle of all time? Well, although I've got to say, it's the Kit Kat one. Give me a break, give me a break, break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. Oh yes, I'm loving it. Memorable, catchy, and instantly connects with the brand. You know who else is looking for a memorable jingle? Ticksplits.com, and they're willing to give away a free ticket to the Chicago Bears Green Bay Packers game for a good one. I knew that. A ticket to the game, and we'll set up a meet and greet with the winner and members of the bar room and other bar flies. It will be fun. Bears go give our listeners some of the particulars while I try to come up with some tick splits sample jingles like for instance how about this one like a good ticket broker tick splits is there these although no no that's that's not a good one no okay here's what you need to do bears fans and barflies step one record an amazing catchy 10 to 30 second jingle for tick splits to use on their social media promos it can be audio only or a video entry step two Submit it via Twitter and make sure you tag both at Bears Barroom and at TickSplits. Step three, send a copy via email to marketing at TickSplits.com. That's marketing at T-I-X-B-L-I-T-Z dot com with Bears Barroom in the subject line. Contest runs from November 19th until December 5th and the winner will be announced on December 10th. Full contest details are available on BearsBarroom.com. All right, you gave me an idea for another one. T-I-X-B-L-I-T-Z. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Nothing no, like that? No. How about, no. How about this one? You deserve some tickets today, so get up and call Tick Splits. No. <laughs> no, please make sure that you're not using any trademarks or copyright infringements. Be creative, and as Matt Nagy says, be you. So head over to Bears Bar Room for all the details. Submit as often as you want. Just please make them better than all those. The following program is suitable for all ages. The phone. A certain magic will always linger with the very name. It speaks of courage and fervor in the world's most brutal game. 55, worn by Doug Buffon, a Chicago Bear through and through. He demanded excellence of himself and anyone wearing navy blue. Tell me what's going on. This is moronic. We're going to get our whipped all the way down the line. I want somebody to get kicked in the and get out there and play. You're getting paid to play this game. I'm playing right. I don't mind you getting beat. I got my whipped many times. But I tell you, I took somebody down with me. You are a professional team. Act like one for God's sakes. Football fans, this is Buffone 55. The John Buffone Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Buffone 55, the fastest-paced Chicago Bears football podcast available. If you're listening live on MixLR.com, tell your friends to join us. If they can't make it, no worries. Tell them the podcast version will be released later tonight. I, of course, am your host, John Buffone. Bears Girl is attending some personal business, so we dusted off that old battle axe once again. Aldo Gondi is here. Aldo, sorry we had to pry you away from the liquor cabinet. What are we drinking tonight? Oh, well, I opened up a bottle of Diplomatico. It's a Venezuelan rum. It's uh, got a really sweet taste. And I just I opened it up only because I wanted to toast your appearance on Bears Hour Live yesterday with uh, Draft Dr. Phil. You guys were excellent. Great, great radio. Uh, actually, that was, what, two nights ago? <laughs> the, yeah. D- Diplomatico is already at work. <laughs> yeah, we was <laughs> say, uh, Trey Elegant over there with whatever the hell you're drinking. But enough about your drinking problems. I'm really excited to have Adam Rank back on the show tonight. Adam is our favorite fantasy football expert over at NFL Network and host of his own podcast, The Adam Rank Show. Thomas Casale of Bet Chicago will also join us afterwards. A jam-packed 55 minutes is coming your way, but let's start the show how we always start it. <laughs> 
It is with our 555 segment. Uh, and for those of you who have not heard the show before, or just to remind, her, to remind everyone that I ask you five questions and you have 55 seconds to respond to each question. The reason you picked 55 seconds is as a tribute to your uncle, Doug Buffon, who wore number 55 during his 15 seasons with the Chicago Bears. At the end of the 55 seconds, I'll blow a little whistle, at which time you can either start to wind it down or screech the brakes. Your call. Let's get started, all right? Okay, put down that Venezuelan bobcat, whatever the <laughs> hell it is you're drinking over there. Let's let's do this. All right, that's a tough job to put this <laughs> thing down. It's really good. All right, question number one. Bob Laguerre of the Daily Herald opines that it was the Bears' defense, not Chase Daniel, who is most responsible for the Bears' loss. He points out that the defense allowed only 72 yards on 24 plays. That's about a three-yard average in the first 29 minutes and 43 seconds. Before the Giants' late field goal, their first six possessions ended with five punts and an interception. But then, in the final 30 minutes and 17 seconds, the Bears permitted 266 yards on 44 plays. That's a six-yard average. Did the defense blow this game, John Buffon, and the clock starts as soon as you do? Okay, first and foremost, if you lose to the Giants, you can't possibly blame just one side. It takes everybody pulling in the wrong direction to blow that game. Yes, the defense had its issues. It allowed too many big plays. They couldn't get off the field in crucial situations, and there were some obvious mental errors in coverage sometimes. But that being said, I'm interested to know what percentage of Bears fans and analysts think the Bears still lose that game if Trubisky plays. I said this last week. Chase did what he was supposed to do on Thanksgiving. He stepped in on short notice. He knows the system well, and he put the team in a position to win but I also warned all of you that let's not get too comfortable with having a backup in there the Giants got fresh tape on Chase Daniel something the Lions didn't get he's going on the road for the second week which is not an easy task and the gap between starters and backups in the NFL is larger than you can imagine if you think your backup is just as good as your starter you must have a pretty crummy starter remember when there was this Mike Glennon sweepstakes last year he was this hot shot backup that looked like he could have a grasp on the NFL I don't think I need to remind any of how that went. I, I think everybody kind of screwed this game up against the Giants. You had to bring up Mike Lennon, huh? You just had to do it, huh? <laughs> anything anything that involves failure, yes, there will be a Glennon reference. <laughs> well done, well done. All right, the Bears allowed 111 yards rushing to the Lions in Week 12, and then in Week 13, 141 yards to the Giants. John, are we beginning to see a bad trend here? What's happening with the team's run defense? 55 seconds are on the clock. Anytime you're ready. Well, they are getting gashed a little bit. Giving up those yards to Saquon Barkley isn't exactly a kick to the stomach, though. I mean, the guy is a phenom. I don't want to call this a trend just yet. The last two weeks have been rough. But you had like four days rest going into Thanksgiving. Then you run into a premier back the next week. That's going to happen sometimes. I like to look at the body of work before Thanksgiving. The Bears hadn't given up 100 yards on the ground since week six against New England. And they hadn't had any major issues as far as injuries go on that side of the ball. So this team still has the tools to be dominant. If they beat New York, we probably aren't talking about the run defense right now. But now they have to go and try to contain Todd Gurley and the rest of the Rams offense. That's no easy task. So will I be shocked and angry if Todd Gurley runs for 120 yards? No. If he runs for 200 yards, well then maybe we start pressing against the panic button a little bit. But this is still a great defense. They can hold their own against any offense in the league. This is the time of year where players start to feel those bumps and bruises a little more. Let's hope they are healed up and ready to make a stand at home. Do you think the weather is going to affect the way uh, Todd Gurley runs, or is he one of these four seasons runners and can run in anything? Yeah, I, I think you could probably put uh, clay, grass, cement. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. He, he's he's probably going to run the same. Were you as high on him as I was when he came out of college? I, I thought I looked at him as a transcendent type player who who should be like a number one draft pick in almost any draft. Did you feel the same way? I did, and I think that because of because of the injury, probably that's what knocked him down. But I, and I but I knew whoever got him, it was going to be a steal, and obviously it has been to this point. Yeah, he's he's a sensational player, no doubt about it. All right, question number three. 28 rushes by Bears running backs. Well, actually, it was 27 since Akeem Hicks had one of them. Right. Um, so evaluate the Bears' efforts so far at trying to run the football and what you'd like to see them do to be a more effective uh, uh, running football team. 55 seconds are on the clock and anytime. 
Well, Jordan Howard, again, held under 20 carries, hasn't had 20 carries since week eight. And I've said I'm okay with him getting less carries. However, against the Giants, he was running hard and he was breaking off some nice chunks of yards at times. 16 carries for 76 yards. That's almost five yards per carry. And it was working pretty well. But for some reason, he was pulled out constantly and replaced with Cohen or Taekwon Mizell, which still has me scratching my head. Who the hell does Mizell have pictures of? He's bobbling kickoffs. He's getting meaningful snaps in what ultimately was an important game. We've seen this before. Before, though, what's one of the biggest knocks on Andy Reid's coaching career besides not winning a Super Bowl? It's losing track of the running game and going away from what's working within the heat of the moment. So who is a star pupil in the Andy Reid coaching classroom? Matt Nagy. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Nagy's a great coach, and I'm delighted to have him in Chicago. But maybe sometimes he gets a little Andy Reidish and more committed to his complex offense than he is to identifying what is working, and he just pounds the rock. Once again, I don't ever want to see the offense revert to back to what it was last year. Nobody wants that. I love this new offense. Uh, maybe don't be afraid to be predictable sometimes if it's working. Nagy's a former quarterback. He's going to love throwing a ball. He, all these oh, yeah. former quarterbacks forget about the run game. I will never forget Aaron Rodgers. This was about three, four season go, seasons ago. He was criticized. for uh, he, he, The team was criticized for not running the ball. And his response was, well, do we really need to? I think he's so that tells you a quarterback mentality. Doesn't yeah, it? exactly. I think Nagy has a little bit of that, too. Yeah. All right. Question number four. Speaking of uh, Akeem Hicks, as I just did, the six foot five, 332 pound defensive tackle scored on a replica of the William Perry Super Bowl touchdown. Now, it doesn't even seem possible to me to lose a game after a play like that. Plus, the fourth quarter heroics. Now, is there a John Buffon pessimist side that is worried that some of the magic of this 2018 Chicago Bears team is fading away and it may be gone? You have 55 seconds. Look, I'm not worried about Magic being gone or losing Mojo or any other of that nonsense, but I will say this loss really had the potential to mess things up. After the game, I tweeted that if you lose to the Giants, you can kind of take a sledgehammer to the past three weeks, and man, people didn't like that. I got called a hot take artist. I was told I was spewing nonsense. One guy was nice enough to tell me to kill myself, so that was a rational, rational lucid thought, but <laughs> let's look at how much things could shift. If the Bears win and the Vikings lose, they have a two-and-a-half uh, game lead, and if they lose to the Rams and beat Green Bay and San Francisco, Week 17 against the Vikings means nothing because they already have the division sealed up hell they could lose to green bay and still be okay but now just for fun let's look at things if the bears are up a game and a half let's say they lose to the rams this is just hypothesizing by the way and let's say the vikings beat the seahawks the bears are only up a half a game and they have to beat green bay and san francisco because the vikings have the dolphins and lions left on their schedule then the bears take that half game lead into minnesota on week 17 and all of a sudden that game is for the division so if the bears beat the giants we're talking about their chances at a first round bye but they lose and now we can actually see scenarios where they don't win the division don't tell me that loss didn't do damage Wow. <laughs> that was, you, you really hit the nail on the head there. Made it look a little bleak. Is, is this a must win game then on Sunday night? It, it it's sounds not, it's like not it. a must win because I think that I think the Seahawks are, are, are playing well enough that they can beat the Vikings. But if the Vikings win and the Bears lose and then everything else goes chalk, week 17 is for the division in Minnesota. So don't tell me that this was a wash, that the Minnesota game, because Minnesota lost to the Patriots, everything's hunky dory. It's not. That, that win against the Giants would have did a lot. I hear you. All right. Before we bring Adam Rankin, your thoughts on the firing of Mike McCarthy, the Green Bay Packers now ex-head coach, and the clock starts now. Well, Jordan Howard, or excuse me, I'm talking about Jordan Howard. Oh, my God. Mike McCarthy probably saw this coming from a mile away. But this is a delightful mess in Green Bay, isn't it? McCarthy probably had gotten stale in Green Bay. That happens with longtime coaches that don't deliver championships often. Belichick keeps winning, so guys keep getting amped to play for him. But look at guys like McCarthy, Marvin Lewis, Jeff Fisher, even Andy Reid when he was in Philly towards the end. Things get stale, and you need a shot of energy. That being said, I don't think Aaron Rodgers did any favors by subtly taking shots at the coaching staff through the media in his usual smug, annoying tone. I think it's safe to say that Rodgers puts very little of the blame on himself when it comes to the Packers' shortcomings. And we ever have we ever seen a guy get more free passes than this guy? <laughs> oh, it's his receivers. It's the play calling. He's getting no help. How many years did Tom Brady have a roster full of guys from the island of misfit receivers and still win playoff games? Some people still think that Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback of all time. I ask you why? Shouldn't that translate into making average players play above their skill set? I know he has been having guys drop passes, but we have seen Hall of Fame quarterbacks do this and not 
not take shots at their coach or not take subtle shots all the way. As for McCarthy, he could probably be a good stabilizing force for a team that needs stability. I'm thinking Cleveland, maybe Arizona, potentially Tampa Bay. You know, it almost seems to me like McCarthy should sit out a couple of years. He needs to reinvent himself because if you can't win with uh, Aaron Rodgers at your quarter, as your quarterback – and, you know, you tumble so quickly. Well, it's quickly. It's, what, been five years since they won a Super Bowl? I don't know. I just think his stock is down. And maybe Cleveland should be looking at one of these young whippersnapper coaches, like the guy that's, you know, coaching the, the Rams. Not the, they're not going to get Sean McVay to go over there. But, you know, look at uh, what's available out there in, in, t- in terms of these young, bright coaches. Well, we saw the Bears try this once when they were going to go out and get a, a hot shot smartest team in the room kind of guy when they went out and got Tressman and then they they completely recoiled back when they said okay we need a safe pick we need John Fox so they, so they went in the complete opposite direction we're gonna see we're gonna see which way Cleveland wants to go with this do they want to go out and take a leap of faith on an offensive guru so to speak or do they do they for a team that has had no stability for the couple decades do they want a calming force in there to see if they can just kind of you know keep everything hold even on, hold on hold on <laughs> I'm almost ready. That's Adam. Sorry, Rich. hold on. That's okay, Adam. <laughs> I'm close. Hold on. <laughs> he knows how to make an appearance, right? <laughs> uh, I think Adam Rank oh is gosh. swimming into his microphone. Are you, are you swimming here? What are you doing? <laughs> I was caught in the rain. This is what happens. Like, as Californians. <laughs> Don't know how to react. Like oh, man, I, I hope you didn't meddle away. Well, obviously, <laughs> now you know our guest is Adam Rank. He's a Bears barroom favorite. Every time he's with us, the information and the laughter obviously ensues. If you don't know, now you know. He's the most lovable fantasy football expert over at NFL Network and the host of his own podcast, The Adam Rank Show. Adam, welcome back to Buffone 55. How are you doing with that Bears loss? Are you, are you still like my producer who's stuck to a bottle of single barrel whiskey right now? <laughs> Oh yeah, that's. I mean, it's it's been a, it's been bourbon therapy the whole week. It's like what is? I don't know what it is about playing a Manning in the rain. I don't ever want to do it again. It brought back bad memories, and so, and it was like, oh, it's the quarterback we shouldn't have been starting against Manning in the rain. How about never doing that again? I'm I'm ready for those guys to be out of the league. We have to be out of Mannings at some point. There will be no more. There will always be rain, but there can't always be Mannings. We're going to see if we can get past that a little bit. But before before we jump into the Bears Rams game, I do want to ask you because you're the fantasy guy. But um, there, a lot of people are, are kind of curious. How many fantasy teams do you actually have? And let me ask, how many of them made the playoffs or are primed to make the playoffs? Oh my gosh, this is going to sound like too much of a humble brag, so I don't want to go into it too much. Yes, it's- I have. I have 14 fantasy teams, so I've cut down a little bit. 14, I, I keep up with them all because it's my job. It's not like somebody – so that's a cool thing. Like People are like, how do you keep up with them? Like, it's literally my job. It's, like, it's, not like, it's not like my boss walks over my shoulder and he's like, what are you doing like, working on your fantasy team? In fact, it's the, it's the inverse. It's like if I'm not working on my fantasy team – I get in trouble. He's like, are you, are you reading about politics? Like, no, you go study – your starts and sits and do not read about like the, the Mars landing or anything pertinent to the world. You focus in on fantasy football. So it gives me a lot of time and it becomes like a, I was going to say it becomes like a job, but it, it works like an assembly line where you just every week, you know, like uh, this happened yesterday when the James or uh, yeah, when the James Conner news came out is you just kind of go through it. You're like, okay, cool. I got to go pick up Jalen Samuel. So I put in waiver claims and just go through the list. I'm like, okay, do it here, do it here, do it here, do it here. And I got it down to a science. And of the 14 teams, 13 of them are oh. in the playoffs. So I feel pretty – and the one oh. team that didn't make it was one – and I, I know nobody cares about my fantasy team. But the one team that didn't make it was really good – and I couldn't start Leonard Fournette last week. Ah. Uh, and so, oh, my gosh. It was a bad awful. I, Yeah, I had, I had Trey Burton. No, I benched Trey Burton for David and Joku. And I'm like, oh, and Joku gave me zero. If I would have started Burton, I would have gotten zero. <laughs> yes. So I guess it didn't really matter, but still. <laughs> oh, man, taking away that perfect 14 for 14, I'm sure I'm sure everyone's really sympathetic and they're feeling your pain on that whenever <laughs> they're, they're 0 for 6. Yeah, or like myself, 0 for 4 throughout the entire year. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, I feel pretty bad about you. So, but, uh, for video, but let's jump into the actual football real quick. Let's begin our discussion with the Rams talking about Sean McVay. He's led one of the best turnarounds I've ever seen. They have 11 wins. They had 11 wins last year. First time in franchise history 
they've ever had back-to-back 11-plus win seasons. When he was hired in 2017, he's around 30 years old, the youngest head coach in modern NFL history. This guy's a real deal, isn't he? Absolutely. I was into this. I thought this was a fantastic move. It's well documented. You can go back and look through my history. I'm not going to try to snow anybody here on this. But I really like the, the embrace of kind of like, I don't want to equate it to Madden, but somebody who has like a little bit more forward thinking. And, and it's kind of like watching Don Coriel, what it must have been like watching him in the 60s and 70s. And somebody who is coming in and embracing a, a different way to play football. And it's a, a direct contrast to what Jeff Fisher was doing, which was antiquated, trying to win ugly on defense. And when you come to Los Angeles, that kind of stuff doesn't play. I mean, they, they enjoy winning and everything, but you still got to kind of win with some style. And I would think back to the, the Lakers with Magic Johnson and, of course, with Kobe and Shaq and everything. Like, you got to win with a little bit of style, and that's exactly what Sean McVay has done. And you can kind of feel it in and around town. Like, people are starting to get behind it. It's one of those things because L.A. is a city of transplants, obviously. I'm living out here. So everybody has their favorite team, and you're like, okay, like I root for the Jets. But now those people are kind of like, you know what, I'm kind of a Rams fan too. So you're kind of starting to see that take over this region. Yeah, and as long as I keep winning, I guess people will still be interested out there. Not to mention, it doesn't hurt to have talent on the team either. The Rams are loaded with it. Todd Gurley leads the NFL in rushing with 1,175 yards. Safe to say this offense revolves around Gurley, or who do you think the focal point is in this offense? No, it still comes down to Gurley. I I think that whoever was going to be the running back, it's really not a situation where you can plug and play anybody in there, but definitely somebody has to be an exceptional talent, which Todd Gurley is. And I remember when I was watching him at Georgia and how good he was in coming out of the draft. I thought the Rams made a really good move drafting him. I mean, it's it's frustrating for us because the Rams had a real annoying habit of drafting guys they didn't necessarily need (laughs) <laughs> but he was the best player available, so they took him. I mean, obviously the thing with Aaron Donald, I was at Radio City Music Hall when they drafted Aaron Donald, and I audibly said the F word, and <laughs> the, the female pre- – we weren't on the air, but the female presenter next to me, and she's a Wisconsin person, so she's a Packers fan, so she was having the best night ever. She's like, oh, you didn't think the Rams were going to take him? Like, no. Like, they don't, they don't need a defensive lineman. They didn't need – like, what are they doing? Like, this is – they got Bobby Quinn. They got all these – they don't need Aaron Donald. We've been mock draft – you know, we had been mock draft him for years, for right. months. You know, and, this, and the same thing happened with Gurley, where they didn't necessarily need a running back. He was coming off a knee injury. It just kind of – it kind of threw everybody to see him come off the board. And what was it, the 10th overall pick? But you know what? They've done a great job with it, and Todd Gurley's clearly one of the best ones. And I think, you know, we've seen some other running backs go down. The Steelers do a great job of always bringing in somebody new, but I think Todd Gurley's a special person. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about what what could have been in drafts because we could we could do an entire podcast about that. We could do nine podcasts about that. But uh, let, let's let's just let's just put that in the back of our minds for right now. I spoke earlier Wait. about the Bears' run defense. I, I said that the last two weeks have been rough, but that I mean, there's been certain circumstances that have set them up for some some rough games. They're trending in the wrong direction, obviously. But what's your level of concern with the Bears containing Gurley and not necessarily stopping, but containing him this week? Well, I don't know that you're absolutely going to shut him down, but I think that you can limit his availability or uh, like kind of lower his effectiveness. I I think that's the way that the NFL works right now is that you never really shut anybody down completely unless it's a a clearly inferior opponent. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's not like 85, you know, I I remember back the, I don't remember, but I remember my dad telling me about the 85 (laughs) NFC championship game and how they were able to contain Eric Dickerson. So those days are gone, but I think that if you can just limit what they do, get some additional three and outs, which a lot of teams don't force them into, I believe that it's not, it's not practical to expect them to, to keep the, the, the Rams out of the end zone, to, to keep Todd Gurley from getting 80 yards or anything like that. But what you really want to do is cut down on the huge plays and don't let them make one big backbreaking play. And I think that that's what the Bears team is set up for. So even though – it's been a little bit disappointing. And again, you know what, though? Like, you look at it, and you look at the defense, and you know, 
even though the quarterback's out, you don't, you're, you're like, oh, is this really that big a deal? It's not like Mitch Trubisky plays defense. But in a way, when he's out there extending drives, like yes. even if Trubisky's not out there, you know, they, it's not like they score every time. But if, as long as he's on the field for a while and picks up a couple of first downs and you're moving the sticks, that helps the defense and it puts a pressure on the other team that they feel that, that need to go out and score every time because the Bears are playing so, so well offensively. So I think having Mitch back will also help the defense, as weird as that sounds sometimes. No, I couldn't agree more. Extend, extend offensive drives, give the defense as much rest as possible. Uh, I, I kind of want to, I want to jump into a nerdy question here. We're talking numbers, not exactly my forte, but we're going to give it a shot. InsideEdge.com states that Rams running backs average over six yards per carry on rushes to the left side this season. That's tied for the best. The Bears, on the other hand, are the best at stopping runs to the left. They only allow about 3.1 yards per carry. If you are Sean McVay, let's put on our Sean McVay hat real quick. Are you running right or are you expecting him to test Khalil Mack and Akeem Hicks you know what I I just feel like he's going to find ways to try to get around that I don't think that he's one of these stubborn guys who's like hey this is the way we play football and this is what we're going to do I think that's a lot of the things that you saw with with coaches like Jeff Fisher is that hey you know what we're going to run we're going to run right at this guy like we're we're going to play our brand of football like Sean McVay does it differently like okay fine I'll find a different way to to be more effective I mean that's the one thing about Todd Gurley that you really have to admire, and really what you admire from this coaching staff is that they find other ways to beat you with their guys. Like, they don't let you take a player out of the game. They're like, okay, you want to stop them on the ground? Fine, we'll, we'll throw the ball to them. We'll play action you to death. We'll do this, we'll do that. So it's going to be an interesting chess match to see who's going to be one step ahead of the other. I feel the, the Bears will be up to that challenge, but that's the one thing about McVay and the one thing that – is really impressive about this Rams offense is that they're more than capable of finding a variety of different ways to move the, the ball down the field. We've seen them utilize guys like obviously Brandon Cooks and Bobby Woods, and now Gerald Everett is becoming a star ever since Cooper Cup went out. So they're going to find a way to do it. I don't think that they're going to be able to, to do what they've done all year, but that kind of stuff does not stop Sean McVay. Yeah, it seems like the coaching philosophy has evolved through the years of where it was just dripping with machismo before of running through a wall, and now it's just like, no, that's stupid. Let's go around the wall. So <laughs> we're kind of <laughs> seeing things kind of take a different direction. And uh, that we're also seeing evolution at the quarterback position. How good is Jared Goff in, in L.A.? He, is he more of the quarterback who threw for 413 yards and four touchdowns against the Chiefs back in Week 11, or the quarterback who tossed for only 200 yards and one touchdown and an interception against the Lions last week? In his follow-up game is it is he in kind of in the middle there what, what what's your what's your grasp on Jared Goff well I hate to say it but I think it's more of the guy that we saw against the Kansas City Chiefs obviously coming off a huge game coming off a bye week we've noticed that a lot in the NFL over the last couple of years now that they've kind of cut back the practice time that these players are allowed to have their bye weeks are no longer that time that they go in and hone their craft or do anything and get better I, it, they really come out a little bit sluggish outside of the bye. I think there are some coaches who are a notable exception to that. Andy Reid always seems to have his teams ready to go after a bye week. He's done that going back all the way to his days in Philadelphia. So it was, it was interesting to see that the Rams didn't handle the Lions kind of the way that you expected them to, especially with the deficiencies they have had on defense uh, over the last couple of uh, well, years, really. But I do believe that the Jared Goff is going to come out and play a little bit better. Now, the one thing, too, that's going in the Bears' favor is the weather. You know, and I alluded to it when we were coming on here, is that, look, look, I I was born in Schaumburg. I know what cold is, you know, but, like, I'm a California softie. Like, it rained today, and it really ruined my life. Like, I was really (laughs) just put out about it. And I was trying to convince some of my friends who are also from Chicago. I'm like, this weather is worse than Chicago. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, this is, well, this is the thing. Like if you have prime rib from Fleming steakhouse every night, and then one night they're like, we're going to give you a a crappy burger from Burger King. That's going to seem awful. But if you eat Burger King every day, like what is Burger King a, a, a seventh day when you've had it from the previous six, like it's no different. Like it's, it's just terrible. And so we get so accustomed to it being good that when one thing goes bad, like we don't know how to handle it. So I'm interested to see how this Rams team is going to be able to function in the cold, especially now that it's going to be a night game. 
is going to be what in the twenties. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm really curious. You know, it's one thing to talk about it and be like, Hey, we're not going to be phased. I remember, I, re- I remember, I remember my dad telling me like when the Rams got off the plane in the 85 championship game. And I know these teams are completely different, but they're like, you can see it on these teams when they get out there, because you think, you know, what cold is, but you don't, you don't know until you get there. I remember a couple of Decembers ago, I had to go back and I was out in, well, I was not out in Chicago. I was out in us, not even Oswego, like past Oswego out in Newark. And I'm like, I remember getting off the plane and going out and be like, you know what? This is colder than I could ever thought that it was going to be like, I knew it was going to be cold. I had jackets. I had, I had long johns. I was prepared. It wasn't like I was walking out there in a t-shirt and I'm like, no, dude, this is cold. And I forgot how cold it gets out here. And especially when you're out there with the lake and everything. So I'm really interested to see how they're going to handle that. Man, that West Coast weather really ruined you, didn't it? <laughs> it really does. It makes, it, it makes me less of a person. It really does. Like, I, how big is my jacket? It was 50 today. I'm like, okay. I go, I'm not proud of myself, but you know what? You got to just embrace it at some point. No, no, I'm not going to judge you too hard for it. I understand. I'd probably do the same thing. <laughs> Talking about that Rams team that might be battling the elements a little more than the Bears will be, the Rams defense has allowed passes of 20-plus yards 50 times this season. That's the worst percentage-wise in all of the NFL. All it takes is an accurate Mitch Trubisky to take advantage of this defect in the Rams D. Apparently, that and, you know, keeping and Dominican Sue and Aaron Donald away from him. But that's no easy task given the Rams have pressured quarterbacks on over 20% of their dropbacks, which is the best in the the NFL kind of a weird conundrum there how do you suspect that the Bears can take advantage of the Rams issue with the deep ball while trying to contain the, uh, the pressure from the middle yeah they definitely have to give him time and, and give him the opportunity but the one thing that that works in Mitch's favor is that he's still able to extend some plays like that mm-hmm. athleticism even if the shoulder doesn't allow him to run like he's done over the the previous weeks this season that hopefully he can stand plays long enough to allow guys like Taylor Gabriel and Anthony Miller and everybody and Allen Robinson to get deep and, and, and really exploit this defense that we thought was going to be a little bit better at, at shutting down the pass. Now, obviously, Aqib Tlaib's been injured. Marcus Peters has been battling injuries and, and he's been pretty admirable in fighting through the injuries that he's played through when really he should have been sitting out. So that – that team could be a little bit better and it will improve at some point, but I still think that there's, there's opportunities for it. It really, to me, comes down to Mitch's athleticism and how much he's going to be able to run and how much the coaching staff is going to allow him to go out there and run. And by the way, and I know this, and I know this is probably a, a little sidebar that I don't need to make, but I love making it because it Please. bothers the, the fraudulent Vikings fans. It's like, you know what, Harrison Smith, you are the Charles Martin of your generation. And I got this, this Vikings fan who got a bunch of wind in their jaw, like, that wasn't even the same. I'm like, you know what, though? It, it kind of was, though. Because that Charles Martin play, awful. Like, not a great play. Don't ever right. do that. But, like, it didn't, it didn't seem out of character for the 80s. You're like, that's just the way they played football in the 80s, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's, that's what I think of when I think of 80s football. It's like, these guys were heathens, and they were slamming each other in the concrete like that. So what Harrison Smith was doing, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's the modern day version of that because he was clearly down. You clearly can't touch the quarterbacks anymore when they go down to the ground. Like there is no justification of that. And I, I and listen, I, I don't want to defend Danny Trevathan or anything like that, but everybody still brings that play up, even though it was 50 years ago and Devonte Adams was up there struggling. He was still struggling. That's the problem. And, Trevathan was already launched when it's whatever. I'm not trying to excuse it, but it's like Harrison Smith does not, does not get enough heat for what he did, taking out one of the best quarterbacks in the game. How dare he? You're right. On a, on a sliding scale, he might as well have just shivved him because it, it's, it's about the same <laughs> right? as what they were doing in the 80s. I, I, yeah, couldn't, exactly. I, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. Now, I want to talk about the Bears as a whole. I mean, you, you obviously, you're plugged into the system here. Give me your assessment of this Bears team. Do you believe this is a bona fide playoff team? Or have they taken advantage of a weak schedule, as some of, some of the critics have said, or underperforming division or anything else? There's, or is this team rising to the occasion? What, what, what's your assessment on this team in general? I feel like they've risen to the occasion in a lot of, in a lot of ways. You know, obviously the, the loss to the Packers was disappointing in week one, but, you know, Khalil Mack had sat out for the entire training camp and was just coming in and learning a new system. And he was a little, you know, 
things happen, you know, and the, the New England game was a little bit of a disappointment because of some special teams breakdowns. And so I, I understand where people are coming from, but ultimately when I look at this season as a whole, and obviously we're not going to put a postmortem on this thing yet because there's a lot of football left to be played, but I think it's pretty incredible that the situation with Khalil Mack, now obviously losing in Miami, that's awful. You wish that wouldn't have happened, but the team battled back and Khalil Mack was injured. And instead of forcing him to play through that injury, they had the presence of mind to be like, you know what, take a couple of days off or a couple of games off, excuse me, we can still go out and beat the Jets and we can beat the Bills. And they went out and they did that. And I, I can't remember being in a position as a, as a team where you'd, be, you'd take your best defensive player and be like, yeah, bro, take two weeks off. We're going to be good. We're going to handle these teams. <laughs> and then they go out and they handle it. And, they're doing the, and they did the same thing with the quarterback. Like, I thought that was a pretty ballsy move to be like, no, yeah. you're not going to play against Detroit. We'll go out and play them. And you, they won. And you're like, okay, cool. Like, and – realistically they should have gotten away with it against the giants as well. Like that's one of all the losses. Like that's the one to me where you're kind of like, Oh, I really just hate. I mean, I hated the Miami loss and I hated the pack. Okay. I hated them all, but the one I'm like, Oh, we, we, they really should have gotten away with it against the giants. They were so ready to fold that, that game away. And I know, and I don't, I listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to second guess the coach. I love Matt Nagy. I love everything he brings. But when they, when they scored on the second city special, I thought back to Chris Peterson, Boise State, 2007 Fiesta Bowl, and you're like, you know what? You got this team on their heels. Just go for it. I understand the, mm-hmm. the analytics of it. It's like, hey, the Bears are the better team, so that you should take it. But I'm like, it's not the automatic extra point that it always is. You know, it's at the right. Meadowlands. It's a 33-yard kick. Like, just go for it. Like, this is, we've come this far. Let's just let it ride and see what happens. I could have handled it. I even, I signed a document on my desk. I said, the Bears can go for it here. I signed it. I was going to take a photo of it and tweet it out <laughs> if they went for two and missed it. And they're like, I fully endorse this move. But, you know, what? But, but, but really, I, I feel good about this Bears team. And I think that every year there's teams that rise up that you're not expecting. And you're like, whoa, where did this team come from? Like last year, it was Jacksonville. I feel, although I kind of saw Jacksonville coming, not to be a, a humble bragger, but of whatever. Of course you did. Um, <laughs> but of course, no, I did though. I actually <laughs> listen. I get a lot of ask, ask Keenan Allen if I get things wrong. I certainly do. But I'll I did see that. But we please like look at his Twitter feed. He was roasting me the other day. It's totally cool. Uh, I was, but the thing is, is like we always see these teams kind of rise up. And you're like, oh my gosh, the Titans are a playoff team. Who knew? And then they kind of fade back the following year. I really do believe in the building box of this team that moving forward, this is going to be a team that's going to be contending for the Super Bowl year in and year out. And really, when I look at it right now, I, I'm obviously I feel confident about this game this week against the, the Rams. The only place that I would be super concerned about the Bears going and winning would be down in New Orleans. But ultimately, mm-hmm. I think that this team's competitive. They'll be Right there in the mix of it, I don't think that anybody's going to want to see them in the playoffs or anything like that if, we, if we're lucky enough to get there. So I'm really encouraged by the way this team is performing and how they've had performed and how it's shaping up for the future. Yeah, and I think a lot of people share that uh, share that ideology. It's, it's just that it's just, as a Bears fan, you just always have that worst case scenario in your head sometimes, and it's hard to get it's hard to it's hard to work past that sometimes. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you some fantasy questions. I want to start with the Bears running Wait. game. It, it seems like you know Jordan Howard owners they they've been there's been numerous occasions throughout the year where it says, oh man, this is a Jordan Howard game. This they, this is set up for Jordan Howard. He's gonna this is gonna be the time. This is gonna be the breakthrough. And we haven't really gotten that yet. If you are a Jordan Howard owner, has he has has he been a guy that you're looking to bench, or is that is that a guy that you draft high and you say I gotta ride this out for better or worse? Now, even the, the loyalist in me understands that you've got to bench Jordan Howard at this point for fantasy. Uh, this is one instance, too. I know a lot of people, I get complaints about it. A lot of people seem upset about it. People try to trigger me and try to irritate me by talking about how he's not performing as a fantasy person. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. The Bears are winning. Like, it really, <laughs> I go, yeah, I guess, you know, it would be great. He's yeah. out there scoring touchdowns each and every week. But I'm like, you know what? I'm happy with it. He seems happy. Him and Tariq Cohen look like they're getting along, that the offense is having a lot of fun. So 
it's disappointing from a fantasy perspective, but you know what? I drafted dudes like Alex Collins too, or not working out or Leonard Fournette who, who missed so much time this year. And then when I really needed them, goes out there and punches a dude wearing a helmet, but whatever. I'm not bitter about that at all. Not at all. No, uh, not, not even in the slightest, but you know, it's one of those things like, yeah, I wish I could start them and everything like that, but I don't, I, I won't cut them, you know, out of loyalty. You know, I, I, I think he's good for the chemistry of my team. No, so I keep him he's around. earned that much. He's he's earned that much. But I think that, you know, what I'm waiting for everybody to completely give up on him. Then he'll go out there and have 180 and three touchdowns, and everybody will be like, why? And I'll be laughing at him. I told you. Now, uh, <laughs> as far as the fantasy game goes, are we seeing uh, an overall shift in the NFL as far as, you know, the reliance on a stellar running game? We're seeing a lot of these teams, you know, use their short passing game as their running game, and that's shifting the fantasy landscape a lot. You're seeing a lot of these scat backs, especially in PPR leagues, especially full point PPR leagues as far as point per reception for those who might not know what that means. But uh, are we seeing a complete transition of what a valuable running back in fantasy really is maybe it's not the number one guy but it's also the the tiny running back who gets five six seven receptions a game oh it's crazy like chris thompson has been injured for what five six weeks until he came back on monday night football i couldn't cut him like this guy has been way too valuable to ppr leagues over the course of the last two seasons like i get let him go this guy this could be a this could be a league winner type of person <laughs> it's and it's interesting like how much value you put on a player like that. And of course, Tariq Cohen for the bears is somebody who's like, you got to start him every week. You don't even question it. Like if you're in a PPR league, you're like, of course this guy's starting like it. It would be ludicrous. It would be like benching Barry carries. Sanders during the middle. Eight carries. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> eight carries. But like benching him would be as, as ridiculous as telling somebody that you were going to be benching Adrian Peterson back in 2008. You're like, no, I'd never do that. Like that's, that's crazy. But as, as much as the game has changed, and you look at that, and you're absolutely right that these pass-catching running backs are so dynamic and they're so valuable in fantasy. When you're starting to look ahead to 2019 and you think about the first round of any, any fantasy draft that you're going to do, like running backs could be the first 10 guys off the board. You know, you're going to have Gurley and Kamara and Barkley and Ezekiel Elliott. Le'Veon Bell might work back. Like, it's crazy that like, running backs are going to be the top guy coming off the board again before everybody goes back to the wide receiver. So even though the position is sort of taken out in football, like in fantasy, now it's becoming more prevalent back to where it was in the, the early 2000s. Yeah, and I, I'm not trying to go too far deep into the uh, the the fantasy rabbit hole here, but uh, I've I've always been a I, I've always been interested by the zero RB theory, where you load up everybody else and then you try to find uh, those running backs really late in the draft that can give you that PPR value. What's what's kind of your thought on that? As far as if you're building your fantasy team, I know it's not draft season, but I just got to ask that question to you. As far as the zero running back method, where you draft everybody and then you pick up your running backs late. See, I wasn't a full, <clears throat> excuse me, I was more um, zero RB at Jace. Like, I was mm -hmm. close to it, but I wasn't, like, all the way there. Like, I would tend to, tend to wait on a running back. And if you look at some of the running backs who are going to be starting for fantasy leagues this week, and you think about Josh Adams, if you think about uh, Jeff Wilson Jr., <laughs> uh, Jalen Samuels, you know, like, all these guys, like, these are going to be, dudes that you're counting on in your fantasy championship like that there's still a a a reliance on players like that but at the same time it, it all comes about just not missing on your picks the early round picks obviously talking about Fournette earlier like I took him first like not first overall but I took him in the first round this year and it was hard when he went down you know it was hard to scramble and try to remain in playoff contention without him so you still need to go out there and, and find these guys, these the lightning in a bottle type players. And you think of, you know, waiting around a, a, a couple of rounds or two. I think my philosophy is going to going to switch next year. I'm not going to be so. I I'll still sort of lean towards the zero RB, but I'm going to be more towards the center. And if I get an opportunity to pick a, a true bona fide stud like Christian McCaffrey, like how amazing he's been right. over the last. You know, number of weeks. I think since week nine, he's the, the leading rusher. So it, it's crazy to think about. But because he wasn't getting into the end zone in the early part of the season, but now he's added that part to his game. 
and has been phenomenal. So I'll probably look at drafting that running back in the first round and then being like, you know what, my next four picks are wide receivers. And then figuring that at some point you're going to get that, you're going to get that guy that nobody's thinking about at some point somewhere down the line. Yeah, I've been riding the Gus bus the last couple of weeks, and it's it's been it's been all right oh, yeah. as far. <laughs> it's, it's it's been There's okay. Another guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, even Tariq Cohen, like a lot of people probably picked him up off the waiver wire because he, you know, he wasn't yeah. he wasn't well regarded. They thought like, oh no, they're going to go with Jordan Howard. Like they didn't think a lot about Tariq Cohen, and then he had that first game, and then people are still like, ah, it's kind of fluky. And then once he had, I forget which game it was where he he didn't score a lot of fantasy points. I don't know if it was the Miami game or which game it was, and everybody immediately just acted like he didn't know how to play football anymore. And I'm like, do you never watch the NFL? Like, this happens to players sometimes. Like, even, even somebody great, like even Melvin Gordon will disappear for a game. You know, it happens. Uh, but obviously, it's worked itself out, and Cohen's been great ever since. So you always find those guys, so I'm not too concerned about it. For sure. And I want to shift real quick. Right back to the to the real game and some some uh, some real uh, accolades. Uh, as far as executive of the year, do you think that Adam or excuse me Ryan Pace would be in line for a, at least be a finalist for executive of the year, GM of the year? I would hope so. I, I really do believe what he did, taking the risk with Khalil Mack and and paying the price that he did. And I know you know, it's going to be a bummer, you know, coming up for the for the draft night in April yeah. and not having a first round pick and everybody's going to be excited, but then look at it this way. Like you get Thursday off. So what do you care? Like, Hey, True. We'll, we'll go up on Friday and see what happens. And really like if Khalil Mack was available in the draft, would you not have taken him? you know, with the first yeah. pick? Like that's, that's exactly what you want. So I look at a lot of the moves that he did and not a necess- And obviously the Khalil Mack one is one that, that stands out far and above of one of the best moves of the year. And everybody's going to keep talking about that, but you look at what he's done offensively and like bringing in a- uh, Allen Robinson and bringing in Taylor Gabriel, like a couple of years ago, like Taylor Gabriel would have been the prize. Like they would have signed nobody else, but they would have signed Taylor Gabriel. And like, he's you're our right. number one. And like, here we go. And you're like, Oh, okay. Let's see how this is going to work out. But then, no, he brought it in. He brought him in as part of a, as part of a conglomerate, you know, as, as part of an ensemble, you know, with Allen. Allen Robinson is such a great receiver, and I know a lot of fantasy people get upset, like he's not putting up 100 yards a game. I'm like, again, don't care because yep. he's excellent at what he does. And so I think all of them working together, moving up to get Anthony Miller, I thought yes. that was a pretty good move. But now you've got those three guys. And coming into next year, when you start talking about the best, the best three receivers, like who has the best trio of receivers in the game, the Bears are definitely going to be in that conversation, if not leading that conversation. Trey Burton is a, very, is a more than capable tight end. They don't need him every game. You can kind of spread it around. And when, he, when you need him to come through, he will be there for you. Adam Shaheen scores a touchdown last week. So I look at some of these moves that he's made, and it, it was a head scratcher. I know a lot of people, myself included, like, when you talk about people who are upset about the price they paid for Mitch Trubisky, I am the flag bearer of that one. Like I lost my GD mind when that <laughs> happened, you know, and, but I hang around with a lot of bears haters and I let them influence me. It took me a day. And they're like, no, 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 this was, this was a good move. But plus you saw the price that everybody else was paying to get at a quarterback. Yeah. Like that's just the price of, of doing business. So I think that over the last two years, Pace has more than proved himself. And if we're going to be talking about executive of the year for this season, he's got to be in the running. If not, then I don't know. I, I will boycott Port. No, I would never boycott Portillo's. <laughs> I would buy Portillo's every day for a month as a protest. I don't know how I would protest. But that's that's how I would try to do it. That's a solid protest. We've come we've come a long way from Dontrell Inman, Marcus Wheaton, and Kendall Wright. That that that's for sure. Oh uh, my Adam, God, Adam! Before we get you out of here, I want you to tell people how they can connect with you on social media, listen to your podcast, listen to all your stuff, watch you on TV, all that fun stuff. And then before you leave, can we get a a final score prediction out of you? Okay. Uh, well, I do appreciate everybody. I know a lot of you have reached out to me before on, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and I'm on Twitter and Facebook at, it's at Adam Rank or slash Adam Rank. My Instagram's a little bit different because some kid's squatting on the at Adam Rank, so it's at Adam Rank NFL on Instagram, and you'll see me commenting on Bears posts and everything. That's really me. 
and everything like that. I'm on Good Morning Football Weekend. You can see on the NFL Network over the you know, weekend mornings. We're up against college game day, but you still give us a shout. We're, we're, we're nice people. We've, you, you'll, <laughs> past you'll enjoy college it. now. Well, but yeah, like, yeah, college is over, so it'll be all good. So, uh, but the big thing is the Adam Rank podcast, which we launched this year, and you can download that on all the applicable podcast facility type things. I don't know what I'm saying, but listen, if <laughs> I'll you get it on my walk, iTunes, yeah, I'll get it. I'll listen to it on my walk. You can, get, <laughs> you can get it on your disc, man, anything like that. <laughs> we have uh, iTunes, Google play, Spotify. Stitcher and Spotify. And the big one, we just had it. Uh, we just got out of this week. We're on the iHeart radio app, which is huge. So if you're flying on a I Southwest plane, we're available for you for free. You don't have to buy the Wi-Fi. You can just sit here and listen to me flap my gums about God knows what. I make fun of the Packers a lot, so it'll be worth it. By the way, that Packers stuff, I, I love how, like, the Packers are supposed to be this classy organization. I'm right. like, oh, they, they always, and they fire their coach in the middle of the season, the guy, who, the guy who got you to a Super Bowl, and I get it. Like, everybody knew that, they, that the end was inevitable. And there, a divorce was going to happen. But you know what? You didn't have to leave his stuff out on the lawn and embarrass him in front of all the neighbors. That's, that's where the thing was. And, I, and this is what's going to happen. And I guarantee you, this is going to happen. Now, Aaron Rodgers is going to go out there. And I've looked at the numbers. And I, I do this as a fantasy person. Like, Rodgers is fine. Mm-hmm. Like, his numbers this season aren't really that much different than what they've been every year of his career. Like, obviously, he had that one dream season where he was out of his mind. But for the most part, his numbers are in line with, to where they always are. And you know what? Now they, wanna, now they think that because Mike McCarthy is going to be gone, that it's going to be this cure-all, and he's suddenly going to become a, a much better quarterback. And this week against the Falcons, it's going to happen. because That Falcons defense is terrible. So everyone's yes. going to go out. And they're going to be like, oh, Rogers is back. We told you McCarthy is whatever. And you know what? They're going to, going to come to Soldier Field in two weeks, and he's going to score 10 fantasy points. And everybody's going to be like, what happened? Like, you know what happened? Like, that's Rogers, and the Bears happened. We're going to finish the job that we should have done in week one. But you know what? Before we get ahead of that, I know I said I would give you a prediction. I think this week it is going to be a spirited contest that the, that the, the Rams will be fun. It'll be a good game, but I think ultimately – the Bears are going to prevail. I'm going to have this one going over the Vegas total. So I think Bears 34, Rams 31. And I think we'll have a lot of fun. We'll, there'll be a lot of celebrating to be had. The fraudulent Vikings will lose this week. The Packers, who cares what they do? And uh, we'll, we'll, be all, we'll, we'll be having a good time. You've made a lot of people happy. Adam Rank of the NFL Network. Adam, thank you so much for being on the phone 55 tonight. Hope to talk to you down the road. Oh, the pleasure was all on this side of the phone. And uh, bear down, everybody. Bear down. That was Adam Rank of the NFL Network. Although, are you still awake over there, buddy? I am. I was fascinated by the interview. Adam is just sensational. Everybody in the chat room is just saying, what a great guest. He's entertaining. Absolutely. He's funny. He's informative. He's, he brings the goods all the time. And you know who also brings the goods? Our next guest, Thomas Casale from BetChicago.com. He's not a regular guest for the second half of Buffon 55. Thomas is the night editor over there, so he is all yours, John. Hey, Thomas, thanks for joining us again. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Real good, real good. Now, I got to ask you, I mean, we weren't doing so great last Sunday. What went wrong against the Giants? You and I both expected the Bears to come out of MetLife Stadium with a win. Uh, what was your reaction to that game? Yeah, you know, it's it's tough when you have a backup quarterback in there yep. because sometimes I, I thought Daniel started the game slow, lost some of his confidence early on. They rallied late. It, it was one of those games, teams that have good defenses, every now and again their defense doesn't show up. It's hard to show up 16 games in the, in the NFL. Only a couple of defenses have ever done it. I thought the Bears looked a little gassed on defense on Sunday. The, they were on the field a lot. And, you know, something you guys had mentioned, and I started watching uh, closely since you mentioned it, is more that short passing game seems to give them trouble. You guys were 100% right on that. And the Giants really hurt them with that. You know, it's the NFL. You go to these sleepy games like New York. You never know what's going to happen. They might have had one eye on this week. Uh, They got caught. But, again, when Mitch Trubisky goes down, you'd like to go 2-0. They go 1-1. You know, Daniel keeps them afloat ready for the big game this week. I think they're okay. 
And, you know, where we are looking on next week, or I guess this week now, we're looking against the Rams. What's Vegas saying about this Bears-Rams matchup? It's very interesting. I'm sure there might be a sliding scale because it's not official that Mitchell Trubisky is going to play this week, but all, all signs are pointing that way. What, what's Vegas saying about this game so far? Yeah, and, um, you know, as I was on here last week, and I told you I didn't think Trubisky was going to play based on the number. You know, I usually mm-hmm. go by what Vegas number is going to be this week at – that's what the number should be. And early money came in pretty good on the Rams, and then Bears money started coming in, so it's kind of evened out. It's, it's closer to 50-50 now. Uh, three points, Rams, that's what I would have it in Chicago. I think Trubisky's, I mean, he, he practiced in full today. I think he's a lock to play, and that really makes this matchup must-see must TV. And we can see we can see some more musty TV down the line. This is an important game for the Bears because, as was pointed out on BetChicago.com th- tonight, if the Bears beat LA and the Saints win over the Bucks on Sunday, it could pave the way for the Bears to play against the Rams at the Coliseum in the divisional round of the playoffs. Given that both teams make it that far, and playing in LA might be a better scenario than going to the Superdome to play the Saints. Uh, who, if you're on the road and you're the Bears, would you rather go to LA or go to New Orleans at this point? Oh, yeah, that's an easy one. You'd much rather play in L.A. Heck, half that crowd will be Bears fans. You're right. So, you know, the, yeah, the Superdome, that's a tough place to play. Uh, you know, there's a couple places out there that really don't have a home field advantage. Dallas, the place is so stinking big. It's like playing in, uh, you know, in, in, in Michigan. <laughs> so they don't really have a home field advantage. L.A., it, when you get to those places like Florida and L.A., you kind of get that mix. I remember when the Patriots used to go to Miami. I mean, that was like 60%, 70% Patriot fans down there. So I think that's going to be an advantage for the Bears. I also think, and I, even though you know, what happened last week in Dallas, I still think the Saints are the team to beat. They're the best overall team with the Bears and Rams next in line. So I think this is going to be a good matchup for the Bears because if they beat the Rams, not only will they get a chance to go to L.A., which is easier to play, but I would have them as the second best team in the NFC. We're moving into the fourth week of the Beat Mike North contest. I want to know, how did Mike do in week three? And tell our listeners how to play for those who are not in the know, because they need to know this. Yeah, Mike uh, Mike had a tough week. Um, we had 20 <laughs> winners. 20 people Woo! won. Uh, so, you know, remember I was here last week, and I said uh, they had to put in the code bar room. Uh, because we had winners the week before, and they didn't put in bar room. So people finally put in the co- uh, code bar room, and we had 20 people win our prize pack. They beat Mike in totals. Mike said uh, totals are his kryptonite. He wrote that on Twitter. So uh, <laughs> we made it, it made it a little easier for people, and uh, two Bears bar room fans won a perfect six for six on the totals last week. So wow. congratulations to them. Go to Bet Chicago. Sign up for free. Just put in the code bar room. And go up against Mike. Six, you got six totals. If you beat Mike, we send you a prize pack right away. Ooh, those bar flies, they're educated. They know what they're doing, and they love to take it to Mike North sometimes. So that's got to that's gotta be, that's gotta be a, a fun time for them and for everybody uh, to get on Bet Chicago. Uh, real quick, let people know where they can follow you and, and Bet Chicago, and tell us a little more about the site for people who are maybe just hearing about it for the first time. Yep, you can follow us on Twitter at BetChicago1. My personal account is at the Pigskin Guy. I do gambling, fantasy stuff, all kinds of different things. You can follow me there. You know, we got everything at the site. We got a bunch of Bears stuff, Blackhawks. We're getting into baseball now with the Cubs and the, the offseason things. Plus, we have national stuff, college basketball every night, NBA, hockey, UFC, boxing, anything you're a plus, ton of fantasy stuff for the fantasy playoffs. Anything you're into, we got it there. If you have any questions, you can always hit us up on Twitter and uh, let us know what you're thinking. That's Thomas Casale of BetChicago.com. Thomas, thanks so much for being on. We'll talk to you next week. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Take Have a good weekend. Go Bears. Hey, you too. Go Bears. Go Bears. Aldo, let's get into the fourth quarter. Hey, John, uh, our fans, your fans, I should say. Um, yeah, they're everybody's fans. They were clamoring for a 55-minute show. 
Guess what? This is our first overtime show. Woo! Oh, we're in overtime, baby, and we're taking the ball, and we're going to score. And unlike Hasselbeck, we're really going to do it. <laughs> what a classic moment in football history, wasn't that? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> All right, so this is the final section of the show. I'm going to ask uh, John five questions. He's got 55 seconds to answer all of them. Actually, I think uh, four out of the five here, and then the final one, we turn off the clock. So let's start with this one, number one here in the second half. We know that the Rams' pass defense has had trouble with their man coverage, although Akib, Akib Talib's return to action against the Lions on Sunday did help, and so they are probably going to improve in that area a bit. But nonetheless, it appears that this could be a huge opportunity for Bears pass catchers. Um, thoughts on which receivers you think, based on what you've seen of their strengths and weaknesses, what are your thoughts on which receivers this Sunday night could have excellent days against the Rams? The clock starts when you start. Okay, given that Trubisky plays, I think there is a need to take some long shots early. You are at home. Get something to energize the crowd quickly. I think Taylor Gabriel is long overdue for some long bombs. Hasn't caught a touchdown in about two months. Let's take some shots. Get the defense to scooch back a little bit. Then maybe the middle opens up for Burton and Shaheen to make some hay. Then you draw the linebackers back, and then guess what? A heavy dose of Jordan Howard right up the gut. But I want to see some vertical stuff this week. Let's face it, if you're playing the Rams, you're probably going to have to score some points. If the Bears can jump out early with some big plays and then play ball control, they're going to be in good shape. Obviously, that's easier said than done. But I don't think it's crazy to think that Nagy would want to come out of the corner throwing some bombs to start the game. This is going to be a dogfight, man. There is no room for hesitation or being conservative. Go out and get it. Matt, I need you to roll the dice on this one, baby. This is going to be an all-out brawl between two of the best in the NFC. Gabriel Cohen maybe gets a few long shots. A-Rob gets his. I'm excited to see what happens. I am excited, too. You uh, Just your 55-second uh, speech there made me excited and ready to go. <laughs> All right. Now, one team that is uh, – that uh, one – team this season has had success in limiting Todd, Todd Gurley, and that was the Saints. They held Gurley to 79 total yards. 68 of those were rushing. Their secret formula, according to them, was 11 guys swarming to the football when Gurley had the ball in his hands. Now, that's what Vic Fangio said was the strategy for Saquon Barkley, but the Bears didn't ex execute it for four quarters. Any reason we should have optimism that the Bears can improve this swarming tackling defense against Todd Gurley? The clock starts now. Well, if the Bears can manage to get up by two scores at any point, and that's a big maybe, maybe the Rams are less inclined to use Gurley, but let's just pretend that's not the case for all intents and purposes. I think you can contain Gurley without necessarily stopping him. It's like when Jordan Howard had all those great statistical games last year and the Bears would still lose. Stats won't necessarily translate into wins. So let Gurley get his yards if he needs to. Don't fret if he has 45 to 60 yards in the first half. Focus on crucial situations like they didn't do last week. If it's third and three, do whatever you got to do to get off the field third and long don't play that half-ass coverage that lets a receiver run in the open field limit the home run plays that can deflate a home crowd in a second nothing kills noise quite like a 65 yard catch and run by brandon cooks or whoever else the rams will throw out there third and goal make them kick a field goal i'm more interested in what the bears defense can do in crucial spots than what todd Gurley's stats are i know i said i'd panic if he had 200 but if the bears win i think i can handle that a little bit better Excellent. Excellent. Now, there is late news that it looks like Trubisky is going to start. Thomas Casale was correct about that. Now, um, he's coming off that lackluster win over the Vikings. I mean, he, he played OK, but uh, there were some moments there where it wasn't quite so good. Now, what are your expectations for him against a Rams defense that itself has had troubles this season, but is still intimidating because of the presence of Aaron Donald and, and Dominican Soup? So what are your uh, expectations and 55? Five seconds are ready when you're ready. Well, they're a hell of a lot better now that Chase Daniel probably isn't going to be the quarterback. I think Mitch will have to use his legs substantially in this game. Not necessarily to rush for a bunch of yards, but rolling out, escaping pressure, getting outside of the middle pressure that's going to be provided by Donald and Sue. And I think that they could work out if they kind of do some QB rollouts, some play action rollouts, design some routes to develop down the field. Let it fly, or perhaps you slip some screen plays into Cohen with some pulling guards and get down the field that way. I'm not saying this is going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be anything but 
about a cakewalk. But Negi, I'm sure, has thought about that pressure coming up the middle and is planning accordingly. It's still weird having this much confidence in a Bears head coach. I almost felt crazy saying that. It's a new concept. I'm getting used to it. But I digress. I think Mitch could have a really good game here. All weapons are at his disposal. And if he gets anything out of the running game, anything at all, they're going to be in a good opportunity to rip off chunks of yards through the air. We are in week 14, man. The Bears are in a division race. There can be no other expectations than good expectations. Bears football is relevant in December, baby. I want to see some Mitchy magic. All right. Nice. Now, John, one of my favorite things to do with you, (laughs) I feel like like the the trainer in a boxing movie. I love to see you fill five minutes worth of information in 55 seconds. So that's what my next question is. Okay. (laughs) Give me five, five keys to a Chicago Bears win. The 55 seconds will begin when you begin. Okay, number one, get out to a fast start. At home against a really good opponent, there's no room for lulls and no room for stumbling out of the gates. Come out prepared and ready to execute. Number two, get off the field on defense. You can't let Goff and company extend drives. If there's a third and long, get off the field. Don't give that offense second and third chances. That'll burn you. Number three, finish drives on offense. Field goals aren't going to go very far in this game. If you are inside the red zone, you got to get you got to get seven, not three. Number four, fumble. You can't have them. Turnovers in general, can't have them. Don't see, don't see, uh, look at Point number two, you can't give extra possessions to the Rams. Number five, this is sometimes going to be out of your control, but you got to play a clean game. Penalties are drive killers. They're game killers. They suck all the wind out of a crowd. What you can't control, but you can control not being stupid. Personal foul crap, like late hits, blatant helmet to helmets, or anything else. Keep that off the field. Those are selfish, pride-driven penalties that don't impress anyone. Don't be a dumbass. John, I got the feeling you could have fit 10 in to those 55 seconds. So next week, it'll be 10 keys to victory. <laughs> well done. Well done. All right. Question I'm number winded. five. Let's, uh, you, this is your, the famous pep talk sequence of the show. Uh, Matt Nagy wants you to address the entire team. This is clearly the biggest game of the season. Nagy needs a fired up football team to hit that field and play 60 m- minutes of sharp football. The clock is off, but the team is at the tunnel and they're ready to go. But first, they're going to hear from you. Go get them, John. All right, fellas, listen up. I know last week's loss was a bad one. I'm still having a hard time getting over it, but all of you have to get over it because you'll get no sympathy from the team coming into our house tonight. They're billed as the league's best, a juggernaut. In September, people laughed and wrote this game off as an automatic L for you. Well, they ain't laughing no more. This game was flexed into prime time. Listen, I know this team is for real. I know you are for real, but they don't think you're for real. We might end up playing this team again next month. So now is the time to show them that this isn't some stepping stone game. It's cold. It's dark. It's perfect weather to send these guys back to L.A. black and blue. People are questioning you after last week. You want to know how you shut everybody up? Go out there and punch the NFC's best team right in the mouth. Play every down like this is a playoff game. You're playing for more than a win tonight. You're playing for your respect all over the NFL. This game is your opportunity. This game is yours for the taking. 60,000 people are rallying behind you. Give them something to cheer for. Give them something to take pride in. Defend your house. Every blade of grass must be protected. Run through this tunnel, run through that smoke, and run through the Rams. Let's go. Bear down. And that will lead me right into my prediction. I think there's going to be a number of opportunities for the Bears to go ahead and stay ahead. They have to capitalize, and I think the defense will come up with a turnover late in this game that allows Mitch to go to work with good field position, and they're going to score late in this game. They're going to take this game 34-27. to Bears win 34-27. Do not forget, this episode of Buffon 55 will be on your podcast stream first thing Tuesday morning. Make sure you share it with all your friends and give us a review on any of the delivery systems you get your podcast from. We are on all of them itunes spotify podbean google play stitcher i think we're on a sega saturn now if you need a floppy disk version of it just email us you name it all you have to do is search for bears barroom radio network and we will pop up Aldo, take it away all right we got plenty of podcasts on your podcast stream any type of program that you want we've got it cars keys is a cool 10 15 minute look at what the bears did on sunday and then the upcoming one that comes out on thursday is about the keys to victory on sunday Sunday. So, um, also remember to get your submissions in for the Tick Splits contest. Don't miss out. Time is running out. All we need you to do is write a jingle for Tick Splits. If we like it, 
and as a judge of four people, if you're the winner, you will win a ticket to the Green Bay Packers game. And just like Bet Chicago contest with the Mike North contest, there's no purchase necessary. There's no credit card that you got to give or anything. You just enter. And so the details about the contest are all at BearsBarroom.com. And don't forget, Trade Busy's Let's Talk It Out Thursday night at 8 Central. And then the Mike North Advantage on Friday at 9 a.m. Both of those shows are appearing here live on MixLR. And then you can join your podcast stream along with you'll find the latest in fantasy football goon show and this show, Buffone 55. Once again, a big thanks to Adam Rank. That was a great interview breaking down fantasy, the Rams, and, you know, weather. That was something I wasn't expecting, but that was, that was a great interview. Although, I think you can go back to the liquor cabinet now. Uh, I just started my second Diplomatico, just sipping on this thing. I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight, and I bet you are too. Take care, John. Vamos! (laughs) Bear down, everybody. Diplomatico. (laughs) Well done.